All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get things started on the, the work session. We've got four different items today, so we've got a little bit to go through. Um, the first item, cold weather homeless response services. This was actually one that was requested by uh, Council Member Willits. And so we've got 10 minutes scheduled um, for this one, and it's information only. Hello, there you go. Mayor, Council Members, how are you today? Thank you for having me. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about warming resources provided by the Our Path Home Partnership during the winter season. My name is Sadie Jones. I'm the Our Path Home Coordinator. I'm here with Our Path Home Manager, Casey Mattoon, and we are the team of two at the City of Boise that administer the work of the Our Path Home Partnership. As a reminder, our Path Home oversees the collaboration of over 40 partnerships to, to strategically manage homelessness response throughout Ada County. We believe in housing first, not housing only. Our Path Home works to ensure homelessness is rare, brief, and a one-time occurrence by approaching homelessness through a multi-strategy approach. Equitable services through our Connect function on the left side of the screen, which entails prevention, outreach services, shelter, and our coordinated entry system. And accessible, affordable housing through our Path Home House on the right side, which prioritizes housing sub subsidies, stability, and housing retention. Intersections of winter and housing instability places unhoused residents at extreme risk for weather-related injuries including frostbite and hypothermia, which could lead to death. The CDC identifies individuals at increased risk for cold medical emergencies as older adults, those with limited access to food, clothing, or heat, people who remain outdoors for long periods of time, babies who sleep in cold environments, those with chronic health conditions, and people who utilize substances. Compounded vulnerabilities increase during winter for people experiencing homelessness, amplifying the need for public warm spaces and accessible affordable housing. To emphasize the neighbors that we are coordinating our efforts for, we wanted to highlight some Our Path Home data and de demographics from October of 2023 uh, to demonstrate those impacted by the experience of literal homelessness during the winter season. By definition, Literal homelessness describes the living situation of community members who are sleeping in the streets, in vehicles or RVs, or households who access emergency overnight shelter. The data in front of you is measured by clients who access services across the Our Path Home Partnership. In reviewing the slides, you will notice that the two biggest groups by age are older adults, defined 55 and older, and children who are under the age of 18 years old. The data demonstrates a high percentage of people with a disabling condition at 57%. 25% of the individuals seeking support through Our Path Home have a history of domestic violence. In chronicity, eight, excuse me, eighteen percent of chronic homelessness illustrates you high might level. I have a quick question here. Yeah. Hey Sadie, will you say that again about the domestic violence? I've heard that stat before, but it's so telling. Would you mind repeating it? Yes, Mayor, Council Member Willits, thank you. That stat there is 25% of individuals who have accessed our Path Home Services in October of 2023 have a history of domestic violence. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 18% of chronic homelessness through our Path Home data illustrates high levels of service need, specifically EMS services. And just for clarification, chronicity is defined as cumulative time, length of time experiencing homelessness as 12 months or, or for, excuse me, chronicity is defined as 12 cumulative months of homelessness or 12 months in total over three years time with a disabling condition. To meet the needs of our community this winter, our Path Home has strategized to expand public shelter space and increase cross-system coordination. 
Winter warming response is primarily about folks in a housing crisis that need additional services to stay safe and warm during winter months. In addition to Corpus Christi House operations, our community's only day shelter, our Path Home is working to provide additional indoor space to anyone who needs it. In partnership, the YMCA is offering full access memberships available at no cost to our Path Home clients during the winter season. Idaho Harm Reduction is opening their doors Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays to provide warming space for the public until later in the evenings. Interface Sanctuary is providing a heated patio, an insulated tent, and adjusting their morning checkout times to, to align with opening of Corpus Christi operations. Overnight shelters, City of Lights, and River of Life are adjusting to provide indoor space to anyone who needs it as well, offering 24-7 shelter throughout this winter. The Boise Public Library plays a critical role by maintaining a warm space with public access and resources to support across the city. We have three public overnight shelters in our community. In addition to standard overnight beds available, Interface Sanctuary is operating an outdoor overnight warming tent and managing overnight overflow capacity. Overnight shelter access is coordinated nightly between shelter partners, emergency responders and healthcare providers are in coordination with shelter and housing partners as well. Medical quarantine beds are available for safe sleeping for those with positive cases of COVID-19 the flu, or the flu through funding provided by Department of Health and Welfare. Additionally, the inclement weather overflow program ensures no resident is denied a warm bed even if max capacity is reached at designated shelter facilities, especially if inclement weather is expected. The overflow program is managed by the Home Partnership Foundation, which is funded through the City of Boise and administered through the RPATH Home Partnership. Just as it is important to coordinate resources, it is also important to distribute and ensure that folks who are impacted have those resources available. Our Path Home is finalizing work with the city's community engagement team to build a winter resource guide to inform residents of available services and resources. The resource guide will be available in print copy as well as digitally. The, guide, the resource guide and map is a new tool being implemented for this winter season. A similar iteration has previously been used to distribute cooling resources in past summers. The resource guide captures available resources, including day and overnight shelter locations, laundry services, and showers through icons and brief sentences highlighting important services available. Furthermore, the guide provides crisis lines, health service locations, and cold weather safety tips. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Mayor? Go ahead. Yeah, Thank Mayor. You. Oh, sorry. We're all, we're figuring this out. It's all good. That's weird. <laughs> Thanks. Um, thank you so much. I wanted to get a better understanding of the numbers. Could you go back to that slide? So when it's families with children, so there's 837 and then there's adult only households. Do we know how many of those like family units, how many children are, are, beyond that count of 837? Cause I'm assuming this 250. 2,500 is essentially adults. Mayor, Council Member Willits, thank you for your question. And if I'm understanding correctly, the question is to clarify uh, around the 837 families with children, if there are additional children outside of that number. Yeah, that, you said that much more succinctly. Yes. So how many children are there in these families? Yes, that is a great question. And I don't have that information in front of me today, but I would love to circle back and get, get okay. that information to you as well. Super. Thank you. And then Mr. Mayor, one more follow-up. Mm -hmm. So I just want to ensure that I have a good understanding as well as the other council members about what's different this winter than what's happened last winter. And it sounds like we've added more opportunities for folks to get warm. Yes. That's the headline. Mayor and council member. Well, it's yes. Yes. We have uh, added additional capacity, including Idaho harm reduction. The partnership with the YMCA is also new. Um, working with our shelter, our overnight shelter partners to provide daytime space. This year is the first uh, winter that we have formalized partnership with Boise Rescue Mission. So there are a lot of things that are new this season that we're looking forward to continue expanding. Thank you. 
Um, just a comment, Mr. Oh, sorry. no, I have a question, but you please go ahead. Just thank you for your work on this. This is something that I, I think a lot about when I go out in the cold and I have a home. And so it's been really um, something that's that's been heavy on my mind about those who don't have the opportunity to have a place over, have a roof over their head. So thank you for all the work that you're doing, Casey and Maureen, and, and then also um, just getting other partners involved and, and the outreach that it takes to then help people know where to go. Because okay. I know it's one thing to have a place for folks to go, but they need to know that there's a place too. So thank you. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, yeah, I just, this is really wonderful to hear, um, the, you know, the more options, the better. And it sounds like we're really um, rounding out the options. How is this communicated to folks? How are they finding out about what, what those options are? Mm -hmm. Mayor and Council Member Steed, thank you for your question. So we are working to ensure that folks who are most impacted by inclement weather throughout the season um, and who are also experiencing some sort of housing instabilities, namely unsheltered homelessness, have access to the information by one, ensuring our partners are prepared and equipped uh, to be able to support individuals in navigating the resources available, namely overnight shelter access. And then also the resource guide serves as a handout um, info sheet for providers not only to have on hand and distribute, but also for individuals to have and use to access or navigate those resources. On the resource guide, there's addresses available, the numbers are available. Um, it also highlights where folks can get additional support navigating winter resources uh, as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I guess one question, um, and I guess, you know, more is always better, more options is always better. Do we feel like we have enough to serve the need that we're seeing, or are we still looking for additional partners in the community to help out with this? Mayor, thank you for your question. I think there is often, and there will continue to be a need to continue to collaborate and coordinate with additional uh, community entities and agencies to meet the need. I just would like to share a quick example around the topic of transportation within winter warming, um, identifying a partnership and some sort of outreach strategy to ensure that folks who are disconnected from the corridor of services um, have access to that overnight shelter. So on Sundays, uh, Valley Regional Transit does not operate. So that is a need and a gap where continued partnership would come in handy. Yes. Awesome. That's really helpful. And, and I just want to say thanks to all the staff and all, to also thanks to all of our nonprofit partners. This is definitely a team effort and us trying to get out there and make sure that people are safe and warm and comfortable. Um, were you on NPR this morning? Cancel. I mean, <laughs> Mayor, yes. Yeah. Yes, good, I want to Good job on Boise State Public Radio. Good story. Thank I'm you. sure it's going to get a lot of attention. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, item number two is the 521 West Grove Street public space. And um, we've got Sarah Arkel here. And it looks like we also have some folks from CCDC as well, if we have any CCDC questions. On um, this one, we've got scheduled for, for 15 minutes. Okay, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, council members. My name is Sarah Arkel. I'm the Parks Resources Superintendent for Boise Parks and Recreation. And I'm joined here today by Carl Woods with uh, Capital City Development Corporation and Kim Siegenthaler, Siegenthaler sorry, <laughs> with Jensen Belts Associates. And we're very pleased to provide you with an update on uh, a partnership that will result in the addition of a uh, new park to our downtown core. Um, the 521 Grove Street property is located at the corner of 6th and Grove. I think that the aspect ratio on this presentation is off, so I apologize for that. Um, but it is within walking distance of the Grove, CW Moore, and City Hall. In 2022, CCDC purchased this 0.2 acre parcel with the express intent of developing a unique public space that would then be donated to the city as a park. In the last year or so, uh, Parks and Recreation as well as Arts and History has been working very closely with CCDC and their con uh, hired consultant Jensen Belts Associates to undertake an effort informed by some visioning work that CCDC has done 
to conduct public outreach and engagement that would then inform a park design. So today what we're gonna do is Carl will provide you with some of the context associated with the design creation and Kim will run through the design specifically. Um, the design for the park was approved by the Parks Commission just last month as the master plan. And then we'll run through next steps. So you'll know what to expect over the next year with regard to construction and then subsequent donation of the park. I just wanna take a minute to thank our partners in this effort. It has been a very uh, positive and rewarding collaboration. Um, it's always fun to be able to work together to build a new park. And in this particular part of town, there's a rich historic and cultural um, element that has been really fun to investigate, learn more about, and um, really put into the design elements that you'll hear about in a minute. We're really excited that this will serve not only the residents of downtown, the businesses and the employees that come into our downtown area every day, especially here in the old Boise blocks, but also provide a, a unique gathering space for the multiple historic and cultural events that occur in this area. So thanks for having us and I'll turn it over to Carl. Carl, just one second. Um, I don't know if, if people who are watching online, if they're seeing anything right now, I just got a message saying maybe that they weren't. So maybe Greg can take a look and see if folks can still see if they're watching online, um, but go ahead. Um, good afternoon, thanks for having us. Um, I'm Carl Woods, Senior Project Manager with uh, CCDC. And wanted to get into a little bit of the background uh, to help frame this thing um, for everybody. So in 2020, CCDC um, engaged the community in a visioning effort for the Old Boise Blocks and Grove. Uh, this area is Capitol Boulevard, the third street, uh, Main to Front Street. And what we, thank you, sir. <laughs> Um, and so what we did is we collected ideas on how we could tee up this neighborhood uh, for future success. These ideas uh, were boiled down into focused investments uh, for the neighborhood. Uh, the one we're primarily talking about today is the 521 West Road Street Public Space. Uh, another visible example of this currently is uh, the streetscape improvements on Grove uh, from 6th to 3rd Streets. So during this process, we learned a lot. We had a lot of great conversations. We had Stevens Historic Research Associates um, on our visioning team, and they reported back to us that uh, through all the research that this neighborhood was really very, very similar to New York City being a cultural melting pot, um, just on a smaller scale. And everybody found that really fascinating. It's become a common thread in a lot of the work that has spun out of the visioning effort. Uh, we also had a lot of really engaged great stakeholders in the process. Um, this was 2020 and um, it was kind of an interesting time for everybody, but we really had a lot of genuinely engaged stakeholders um, from businesses to residents, property owners, general public. Um, and we had the good fortune of having one lady who had grown up in this neighborhood and she shared with us all of her fond memories of, of this cultural melting pot of this very diverse, welcoming, inclusive neighborhood. Um, and that was Miran Ardiach, uh, also the former owner of 521 uh, West Grove. And so as those conversations uh, continued, uh, the visioning report was pointing to uh, more public space, desire for that, and Miran had a service parking lot. We broached the subject of, hey, you know, what do you think about us buying this and developing a public space? And she was on board with that. So we talked to our friends at Parks and they said, yeah, we like the idea. And so we negotiated um, a purchase agreement and she could have sold this to anybody, but she chose to sell it to CCDC um, with the stipulation that it was, that it was um, to be used for public improvements, including a park and that those improvements um, would recognize and celebrate the history, contributions, and the culture of the diverse populations of the property's historic Boise neighborhood. So she wanted to take all of these memories um, that she cherished growing up and share them with the community and pass it forward for future generations. So th I mean, that's kind of the heart of this, of this project and it's such a cool opportunity. So from that point, CCDC bought the parcel in January of 22 and we sat forth to uh, build a public space honoring Miran's witches. 
So the first thing we did, uh, we selected a design team. Um, Parks helped us with the selection process and we hired Jensen Belton team. Uh, you're gonna speak to Ken in a little bit here. And then we sat down um, with the design team, Parks, Arts and History and CCDC to figure out what we need to know from the community to build a successful public space. And so from that stem, from that point, we worked, as Sarah mentioned, really closely and really hard together to um, come up with some public outreach opportunities, uh, the first of which was an online community survey. Um, so this collected input um, for the amenities, the meaningful aspects of the history and culture uh, that people wanted to know about. And we had almost, uh, well, we had 935 total responses, 30% um, of which lived in downtown Boise. So uh, that's, a, that's a really great response rate. And so we were able to take uh, all that input and the design team took it and developed three distinct uh, schematic designs uh, for what this might look like. We took those back out to the public through an open house and through an online survey uh, to gather more feedback to further refine this to, um, to keep the process going. And again, we had just stellar uh, turnout on it. Uh, the in-person open house was packed for two or three hours and just a lot of excitement. And we had 300, 299 online uh, survey responses. So um, these are some of the highlights that you you have probably seen. Um, I won't read them verbatim, but there was a lot of interest in uh, the culture and history of the area and a lot of interest in being inclusive of all cultures. People wanted to interface with uh, nature and green spaces, and they wanted places to eat and to sit and to hang out with their friends and have coffee. And they also wanted public art. They're very interested in public art, but they didn't want just something that's amazing and beautiful. They wanted something that identified with um, the old Boise Box history and the area. And so our design team took all of that feedback and magically um, condensed it down to a preferred design alternative. And that is what Kim's gonna walk you through. Um, good afternoon, I'm Kim Sigenthaler, Principal Partner at Jensen Belt Associates. Uh, we are the Project Landscape Architecture Lead um, for the 521 West Grove Public Space. As Carl mentioned, uh, we've worked for quite a few um, months um, on this new public open space, including extensive outreach, like Carl just went through, um, to, to garner feedback on what the community wants to see in this area. Uh, from the public response of the three design options presented, our design team, including project visionaries, DGF architects, um, we've combined the most desired featured into one proposed site design. So you can see that on the screen there. Uh, we are incredibly excited to be working with the soon to be selected artists from the arts and history artist selection process um, to really dive into the integration of the history and culture into these design elements. And I'll go over that here in a few minutes. Um, opening the space to Grove Street and the Bass Block connects the site to the surrounding sidewalks and the intersection of 6th and Grove to host larger opportunities such as markets, festivals, dance, and music opportunities. Um, but on a daily basis, this is going to be a great space to come and have lunch or spend time as it's intended to be a lively hub of um, neighborhood activity. Power stations, Wi-Fi, bike racks, power and water for larger events and pet waste stations will be some of the amenities in this space. Um, the notion of celebration is the backbone of this project and it takes form um, of integrating so storytelling through the physical forms and elements in the park. This is coupled with the idea of connecting and gathering and the ability to have plenty of seating for a variety of interactions and activities to take place. History, culture, and the creation of a great space is the goal the design team has been working towards. This is supported by undulating planters, shelters, um, and is staged to create a welcoming and comfortable space for gathering. I wanna move this over here so I can do the slides. Um, so here are some uh, 3D renderings of what the, what the space is intended to look like. 
Some of these elements are conceptual at this point and have not been designed. And we'll get that further into that as we go into design development and construction documents. Um, but this is a view looking west from Grove Street into the public space area. Um, there are shelters in this area. Um, shade canopies can provide some environmental control, which will make more comfortable um, for people in the year round um, to spend more time there. Um, here's a view from 6th and Grove intersection. You can see some of the seating elements and planters in this area. We're intending to integrate the sandstone that we're using currently on the old Boise blocks, um, 5th to 6th, or excuse me, 6th to 3rd Street streetscape. So that um, design element will run into the park area. There will be planters in this area um, that will have native and adaptive type plantings. We're working closely with the city forester on um, tree and plant selections uh, for this area. Here is a view looking in from 6th Street into the park. Like I said, these shelters are purely space holders at this point and will be designed. We're really excited to get an artist on board um, and have them integrate art into these uh, possible areas of integration could be the shelters, the seating elements, and also the ground plane of this um, park. And so this is from the public out uh, alley looking um, kind of northwest out of the out of the park. There is a raised stage area um, that can for function as a nice place to sit, but also serve as a stage or band shell, um, or excuse me, band stand for people to present their culture and ideas. Um, it's a space for dance, for music, and will serve as a vessel to support and present ideas and cultures. Um, so, so these are kind of some of the elements like I talked about. Um, we're currently working with arts and history on the artist selection um, portion of this. Uh, we have interviewed three artists and I believe one has been selected. So we're really excited to get them integrated into the project and um, part of the design team to really get that element into the park. Um, uh, so um, going forward, next steps, as you see on December 5th, that's today, we are at the city council work session to kind of give you guys a update of where we are. Uh, we are, will be submitting a design review application this next month um, and get designer review approval January um, 2024. February to July 2024, we'll be doing construction documents. And then construction will begin October 2024 through July 2025. Um, and hopefully have a ribbon cutting as this uh, district sunsets in the fall of 2025. So um, any other questions? All right, thank you so much. Any questions from Council? Go ahead, Mayor. Council Wilkes. I have a couple questions. Thank you so much. And I don't know, maybe Doug wants to answer this or Sarah. Uh, first of all, amazing. Um, <laughs> I think some of the greatest cities of the world have these, what I call pocket parks, where they're just, you know, these little enclaves of heaven within the city and people love them. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, and thank you to the, to the woman who you know, sold the property for this purpose. I'm curious about the artificial turf. Do we have that in any other parks? Oh yeah, so there are a couple examples right outside the city hall, um, that is artificial turf. Mm -hmm. And then right around the corner, there's a, an apartment building that has artificial turf. We have worked closely with parks departments, their maintenance staff on what would be the best material for this area. There are a lot of um, people with dogs in this mm -hmm. area, which make it very difficult for real turf. It becomes muddy and spotty and then you have to, um, quarantine those areas or, or so the grass will grow back. And so there is some trade-offs and some benefits for both of those um, uh, different types of materials. So we, yeah, we are looking at artificial turf at this point. Mr. Mayor, one more okay, follow-up. have anything to add? <laughs> uh, I think one of the things that we forget or we, and we also need to help people remember is just how much diversity there was in, in Boise mm -hmm. as it was getting settled. 
how will that be represented in the park? Because I see some really incredible amenities, but I'm just wondering how we educate folks about that melting pot that was brought up. Yeah, and that's one thing that really, we're really excited about getting the artists on board because that's really what their focus will be okay. and integrating. And that can be through storytelling on the ground plane or um, the, the different elements in the park. And right now, we're really leaning on them to, to help us tell that story. And they've got loads of information that um, Stephen's historical research has done and also arts and history has provided them telling them all those stories. So yeah, we're really excited to see how that uh, materializes in the park. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, I would just relay a great job with the outreach um, from Grove Street to the park to everything. There has been so much community involvement all the way from 2020, whether it was, you know, our groups that are putting on events to our bicycle community to different artists and folks. It's been awesome to see. And, and Council Member Will, it's kind of similar to the project that you've been a part of for artist selection. It has been really fun. I've been able to be the council um, liaison to the artist selection for this particular one. Um, and really exciting to see what that storytelling element and how they are able to engage with the community to help tell that story. I think it's going to be really exciting to find out. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Next up, we've got our last item. It's the airport parking rakes and concessions. We have 45 minutes. Are you going to use all 45 minutes? It depends on how many questions you have. We'll see. Have. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions that members of the council may have, but I wanted to um, come before you and share some information about upcoming things at the airport. There are two distinct and unrelated, but um, I think best to be here once and share this information with you. And then um, we can address them separately or together and feel free to chime in and ask questions as we move forward. The first item was something that we really didn't foresee, and that's um, parking has been incredibly popular at the Boise Airport. We continue to see tremendous growth. As you may remember, we opened the East Parking Garage in August of this year. We added over 1,100 spaces, and uh, we thought that would be sufficient uh, for our current demand, and we do have, obviously, the economy lot parking available as well, but what we're seeing that we did not anticipate is that the main garage regularly fills up and reaches capacity before the East garage. And so prior um, to now, we've only had one parking rate for the garage. And I will just scroll to the next slide. So these have been our um, prices today for our parking amenities with a single rate for the long-term garage and because the main garage is definitively more convenient and therefore fills up more quickly, we're proposing to increase and differentiate the rates between the two different parking garages, keeping the economy lot the same price and the short-term garage, which is our premium product, the same price, but differentiating between the different um, other different amenities and service levels that we offer. And so this will become before council in a hearing next week. Um, it does not impact the tax base, uh, but we did think in a spirit of transparency and because that's the process that we've always used before that it made sense to bring it before council and work session today and then bring it back for a public hearing next week. But I would be happy to answer questions that you may have about this particular item before diving into our airport concessions. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Rebecca, thank you. And I have noticed this. Um, I want to give um, folks a shout out because I don't know how many folks are still used to the new way of getting to the East Garage. And so I've had the experience where I go into the main garage and someone's there and they help me to know how to get to it. And so mm -hmm. that has been really helpful. And I appreciate that, you know, that human touch as people try to figure out the different ways that they can, they can now park because for so long things were under construction. So thank you. I think it makes a difference. 
Mayor, um, Madam Council Member, thank you for that feedback. I will certainly share that with our parking vendor. And I will note that we are always working to improve signage. And anytime we're getting used to a new system, we have to, you know, use it for a few weeks or a month and see how it works and then make adjustments. So I appreciate that feedback. All right, well, I'll move on to our concessions and the discussion on that. So typically we issue a request for proposals for concessions. Our existing contract has been in place for 10 years. Our cadence has been to do a request for proposals every 10 years and change our concessions on that 10 year, 10 year a horizon and we're just embarking on that our existing contracts will expire in um, October of 24 and so we are planning ahead so that way we can issue our request for proposals uh, go through that process and allow enough time for permitting and construction and then we'll do the official changeover on October 1 and there will be a year of construction but at this beginning point, I thought was an opportune time to come before council, share what the program goals are, um, how we're gonna measure performance, some of the space requirements, the trends that we're seeing in the industry, and then what we're projecting for plans and um, sales projections and give the council an opportunity to provide input because I know that the airport is the first and last place where visitors to Boise who are flying have um, an impression of Boise. We want to make sure that it's a positive one and that it reflects our community. Before I jump into that, though, I would note as we go through this process, when we open requests for proposals, and it's very standard uh, with bidding and proposal processes for the city, but council members, commission members, and airport staff have to be mindful of the potential for potential proposers to approach council and uh, they cannot solicit or um, I, is, the right word is escaping me, but you know what I'm thinking. I, I can tell by the head nods. Um, they cannot try to persuade uh, council or lobby uh, council members. So the program goals, of course, we want to promote innovation and creativity we definitely want the airport to reflect our Boise community, create a sense of place. We wanna have a variety of product offerings and we want it to be a mix of national, regional and local brands. Uh, one of the key things that we're looking at in this particular proposal is to utilize technology to expand offerings and improve customer service. And we'll talk about it a little later in the presentation. But one of the trends that we've seen is difficulty in hiring. So to the extent that we can use technology to streamline um, customer service, we want to do that. Of course, we want to optimize sales and our revenue, and we want to be good stewards of the environment and encourage sustainability. So when we look at our concessions, we measure them uh, using some key metrics, obviously gross sales. A one that's unique to our industry is sales per employment. So sales to the number of passengers that are going there. Uh, these other ones are, I think, more standard in retail sales per square foot. And then the utilization factor. Um, so that's the number of square feet of the concessions per thousand um, in-plane passengers. And the, the goal is to have a balanced program. And this slide here is just to highlight maybe some of the differences between what would be an important goal for the airport versus what would be an important goal for the operator. So for, we all have um, similar goals, uh, but the reasons are slightly different. So the airport would wanna maximize customer satisfaction, optimize our sales per square foot to allow the operator a reasonable rate of return. Um, but the operator is gonna be interested in having less space um, to increase the space, or excuse me, the sales per square foot. Um, and they're gonna be interested in recovering their capital investment. Obviously that's gonna be important to them. Whereas that's not as important to us. We're more concerned about the appearance of the concession. And of course the investor is gonna to wanna to maximize uh, their operating cash flow and their return on investment where we're really more focused on uh, again, creating that environment for the traveler that's positive and providing the services that they need. So these are the key metrics today for the airport where we were in 2019. 
uh, versus we where we were in 2022, which is the last year that we have data available. Obviously, we're not through 23 yet. So, and plane passengers square foot gross sales sales per in plane passengers square sales per uh, square foot, and then again that utilization factor. And the first one, excuse me, was for food and beverage, and then what we're calling retail or convenience and gift. So all that to lead into the discussion about benchmarking and how we will measure um, the sales and how we'll compare our sales revenue and concession revenue to other airports. But it's important to recognize that every airport is different. So for example, an airport where you're a hub, one of the larger airports, they're going to have more dwell time in the airport because you have people who are transitioning and traveling. So it's just a recognition of the fact that all of these different things can impact um, the way a concession performs. So we want to look at our future space requirements. And the first thing that we're going to do is consider the sales and performance of our existing spaces, um, sales per in-plane passenger and sales per square foot, and then review the benchmarking statistics, how we compare to other similized, similar sized airports in these particular um, metrics, and then determine the utilization and apply it to our passenger forecast and then review um, the results for food and beverage and for real retail. And that's how we come up with what our space requirements are. And not surprisingly, given the growth that we've seen over the last decade, we are seeing a much stronger demand for both food and beverage and um, gift and convenience. So based on the concessions that we have in place, which were based on 2012 and 2013, we need an additional 6,700 square feet of concession space. And we're proposing 4,500-ish additional square feet for food and beverage, and then another 2,200 additional square feet for retail is what would be ideal. And really the best place for additional retail space is in the core rotunda there as you go through security screening because it gives you maximum access. So some of the additions that we're considering in that central core include a coffee um, on in the rotunda level and then on concourse C, which is the lower level where Alaska, primarily Alaska boards is another bar and cafe. We are not proposing additional space on Concourse B because we are envisioning an expansion of Concourse A in the future. And so that would result in a shifting of traffic away from Concourse B to and C to A at some point in the future. But uh, I'm not gonna read all of these to you, uh, but you can see there are a number of changes and things that are happening in the concession industry that we just wanna be mindful of and incorporate into our request for proposals as we move forward. Uh, again, food and beverage is a higher priority than retail. A lot of people are doing more shopping online. Uh, we do wanna stay focused on local concepts, including locally sourced merchandise, but we do have to remember that national brands are important. People who are using the airport, yes, many of them are Boise residents and are familiar with uh, the offerings that our community has, but many of them are coming to visit Boise and want to know and have the knowledge of what that national brand is. And then one of the key concepts is what we call the store within the store concept. So it's one big store that offers a variety of things, but it will have a specific section of a store that might have a particular brand. So think for, as an example, in the Boise airport, we have the Brighton store within the store. So if you've ever gone into the Boise airport, the main marketplace store there, it's a big store, but it has a smaller section that's strictly Brighton merchandise. Um, you might see that with an Apple display or some other things. Maybe it's Yeti, um, pick your brand, but um, so that's the store within a store concept. We do recognize that coffee continues to be incredibly um, popular and important. And I hear lots of comments from travelers um, and stakeholders about their desires for different coffee. And then innovative vending. Vending has definitely come a long way in the last 10 decades to uh, vending that offers a greater variety. It's not just a candy bar, a can of soda, or chips. 
there's uh, CVS vending machines, there's coffee vending machines, there's vending machines where you can get salads. So we definitely want to explore that as another option. And then again, using technology for app-based ordering, uh, we think can also be a nice addition. And I touched on this a little bit. Again, I'm not going to read this whole slide to you, but there are a number of factors that are impacting the industry. Many of the same things that we're seeing in other industries, uh, the concession industry is not unique in, um, in these particular items. The one thing I would note is that operators are selective in the RFPs that they're responding to. It's very time intensive and expensive for operators to respond to an RFP. Um, so they are selective in that. I think Boise will be an attractive market just because of the growth that we've seen and the continued growth that's projected. But uh, just a few noteworthy points. We do want to, again, optimize the space in the center core because that will give the vendors maximum exposure for um, food and beverage and also for retail. But this is this slide's particularly focused on food and beverage. Uh, we do want to have a pre-security unit, unit um, something that's local or national, kind of a coffee bar. Um, and the idea would be to have them offer delivery service post-security screening. Uh, and we would consider requiring them to offer an app-based ordering for pickup or delivery. And then quick serve, obviously at the airport, things need to be packaged and sized for travel. Um, and then again, the proposed new coffee in the center core with the cafe or bar on Concourse C. And looking at new areas for vending, uh, possibly pre-security or post-security for food and beverage. On the retail side, again, same thing, using existing space, uh, one space in the center concour one, concourse, two on B and one on C. Uh, we would require them to have a national brand and local merchandise in the stores with distinct section, sections, the store within a store that I mentioned earlier. And then again, variety in the retail vending, both pre and post security. And we would locate food and beverage and convenience and gift together on the vending. So hopefully you can read this. It's a little bit of an eye chart, but it's just a projection of what we think sales will be, be like. I will tell you that forecasts are outdated. <laughs> the second you print them, um, we found that our forecasts have been um, overly conservative compared to the growth that we've been seeing. But that said, we're projecting that 2026 would be the first full year that all of the units are operational. Um, we're projecting an annual inflation rate of 1.5%. And then I've provided for you here the um, historical sales numbers, which is just a point of reference. So right now we are finalizing the RFP. We, in um, October hosted a, an outreach meeting where we invited national proposers that provide both food and beverage and convenience and gift to Boise and also invited local vendors and operators to meet with these national vendors to do a matchmaking. We had over a hundred people attend. So it was very, very popular. I think interest is very strong in our program in the RFP. We're looking at updating the key business terms from the last time that we did this proposal 10 years ago. Uh, we'll be looking at the minimum qualifications. One of the key things is the proposers can only win one of the packages. So you can't win food and beverage and news and gift. You can only win one. Again, we're looking at a 10 year term, which is consistent with what we've done in the past. And the way that we calculate the rent is, is a percentage. So we calculate, um, we request a percentage of overall revenue with a minimum annual guarantee. So the minimum annual guarantee is a number that we'll establish and it will be based on our current sales and it'll be 85% of the sales that we see in calendar year 2020, uh, 2023 um, moving forward. So that would be the minimum rental that they could propose and then they could propose above that based on percentage. 
So we'll look at, um, again, the key business terms. One of the other key things that I mentioned earlier is the capital investment. So we're proposing a minimum investment of $600 per square foot for the food and beverage and 400 per square foot for retail. This is based on what we're seeing without the, throughout the industry. And then we're also requiring a midterm capital investment. So at the five-year point, we want to make sure that the program is refreshed and that it's looking, um, it represents Boise the way that we want it to represent Boise. So there's an additional requirement for a midterm capital investment. ACDBE, that's an airport's concession disadvantaged business um, enterprise. So basically uh, women and minority owned businesses, we have a percentage goal for that. We do have a pricing policy. So we do want to ensure that not only do we have great amenities and offerings, but that they're also comparable to what you would find um, in other places. And then we also are requiring proposers to submit drawings. So we have a full understanding of what they're proposing. And then um, we will be doing updating the lease agreement and SI partners is our consultant that we're using for this. The evaluation criteria, uh, I've provided for you the evaluation criteria that we used in the prior RFP, and then what we're intending to use for this RFP. They're very, very similar. Uh, there's a little more detail in the proposed evaluation criteria for um, this RFP. Again, the concept plan, what they're planning to do, how it's going to represent and look in our, in our terminal. Uh, the mix of national and local concepts, what they're offering for menus, merchandise, um, how they're going to create a sense of place. Design and quality of improvements is one is a category that we've added. We really want to focus on having a good capital investment. We'll also consider their experience and qualifications. Where have they done this before? Uh, how are they going to manage market, the operations, and then their technology plan? Because technology will be important. Uh, concession rent is important because it helps to be helps us to be able to reinvest in our infrastructure. So revenue to the airport is important, and then just their overall business plan would be the final criteria that we're using. And this is the timeline. Um, again, apologies, this is a little bit of an R eye chart, but you can see all the different things that goes into issuing this RFP. It starts with issuing the RFP in January. Um, with time allowed for questions, proposals to be received, we're expecting proposals will be received um, by Boise in early April, then that gives us time to review them, respond, um, and then bring our recommendation back to council in a time where we can award that allows enough time for permitting um, in a construction period that would start and then hopefully new, new um, units opening but the actual transition taking place on that October 1 of 20, um, 2024. So with that, I am happy to answer questions. All right, do we have any questions from council? Yeah, go ahead. Mr. Mayor, um, just a couple, thank you. Very thorough um, presentation. So. Uh, this is maybe just a, for my information, but how does this transition period really work? What is that like for the consumer if you're transitioning from totally different vendors? And I see here on the slide, there might be temp facilities. And, and what does that look like for the customer? There will be temporary facilities. My hope is that we will be able to um, award in a timely manner. So that maybe some of the new concession space that we're proposing, that that would be able to be ready for that opening, I don't know that it's viable within a you know a six month month time frame, uh, but that would be one thing that we would look at. But for the transition of the others, it they will actually transition at midnight. They'll do some prep work leading up to that. They'll exchange all of the keys, all of the infrastructure, and it's usually negotiated between the existing tenant and the new tenant. And I would note that we are doing an RFP. Um, our, I fully expect that our existing tenants will also put in a request for proposal. The last time that we did this process, we had our um, convenience and gift actually stayed and the successful proposer was the one that we had before 
we did make a change from host to Delaware North and our last proposal. So we had one that stayed the same and one that changed just as a point of reference. So I don't want to presume that they're going to change, but I also don't want to presume that they're going to stay the same. And so if they do change again, the companies will negotiate um, leading up to that change. And then uh, they will do a switch literally in the middle of the night. And then we'll start putting up walls that say coming soon with construction going on behind um, the different venues. And so we'll have a limited number of concessions for a brief period of time. Mr. Mayor, yeah, I guess that was my kind of follow-up question to that too, is just if that all happens at one time, does that mean there's not a lot of concessions or is it kind of rolling so that you make sure you've got kind of coverage during that transition period? It is definitely enrolling and where we're adding new concession space, I would envision that we would open the new concession space before we close any of the existing concession space, but it will be rolling and we'll close as, you know, one spot at a time or one food and beverage spot and one news and gift spot at a time. Okay, great. Sorry, one more. Well, <laughs> um, I appreciated kind of the the background on some of the trends that you're seeing um, mm -hmm. with uh, especially retail versus beverage, food and beverage. Um, I was just curious if the comment that you made about that balance between us wanting um, individuals to understand some brands that might be here in Idaho versus more national recognized brands. Is the store within a store concept something where you're able to maybe accomplish that as well, it kind of to, to find that balance or is that, are those two totally different distinct concepts? No, they are the same. Okay. So, and on the food and beverage side, I think is where people have more affinity either towards a local brand or a national brand. Uh, I think on the news and convenience and gift side, it's a little bit different. Um, but that's where you see the store within a store is primarily on the retail side. And then the food and beverage is more either national brand or local brand. I think we have Smashburger and we have Bardenay. Great. Thank you. Other questions? Go ahead. Mr. Mayor. Um, Council Member, yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, two things. First, it's like another thoroughly worked up detailed and well thought out presentation from our amazing airport director. So thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to personally validate the coffee data point <laughs> as a very frequent early morning traveler to the airport. Yes, it's coffee. And more specifically, it's quick, cheap, black coffee. So although I will not be weighing in on any proposals, um, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to seeing what emerges because um, uh, we will take that as a data point. Thank you. But, but seriously, thank you very much for a well thought out business plan and presentation. Thank you. Council Member Woods. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. One thing you said I think is really worth repeating um, because Boise is a destination, it's not a connection. And that yes. changes the dynamic of what is offered at the airport. And I think that's really helpful as, as you have gone through this process and what's available. So with that in mind, I have two questions. One is I'm always ingratiated and excited when I see so many people in the library section um, of the airport. Is there plans to do other things like that that show city services and extend those as part of that? And then I have a follow-up after that. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, Madam Council Member. And um, thank you for only asking me one question at a time because I start to ramble and then I forget what the second question is. So I appreciate that. And I'm both happy and sad to say that the library is going to be go away. Um, we are going to be adding restrooms in that area. Again, we've grown so much that we do not have adequate restroom facilities in that area. And so we've targeted that specific area because of its location to the restrooms and its proximity to infrastructure um, you know, plumbing and that sort of thing for additional family restrooms, um, uh, ADA restrooms, and then gender neutral restrooms. So you probably will see that coming in 2024, 2025. So I love the library. It was something that I had proposed when I first started here, but, uh, restrooms have to take priority, but I think we'll see if we can find another spot for that. And I think that is a good way for us to, uh, promote city services and, and we do promote the city 
if you come to the airport, you can see some of our signage, particularly on the rotunda. And as you're going down the escalators, city signage with our city vision is very visible uh, in those locations. So we're going to continue to seek opportunities to highlight that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. One more. Uh, so in the previous presentation, we talked about the city's efforts to bring more of the arts and history perspective to our city through parks and through other means. Is there an opportunity to do that at the airport? Like for instance, in some other airports, they have live music from local musicians or they have you know demonstrations of paintings and things like that. Has that concept come up? What does that look like? That is, is that even an option within the plan? Educate us on that. Sure, Mr. Uh, Mayor, council member. Thank you for that question. We do have a arts, a public arts program that the council adopted and that we're looking forward to implementing over the next several years and actually implementing physical artwork. But beyond that, we do have opportunities to have, to showcase local artists and uh, services. Recently over Thanksgiving, as an example, we had the therapy dogs out to the Boise airport. Often during the holidays, we will have musical performances at the airport. So we do some of that. We also have the Boise Art Source Gallery that has a spot at the airport that may or may not continue as we continue to look for additional concession space. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to figure out how do we incorporate and showcase, continue to showcase artists um, at the Boise Airport. Great, thank you so much. And a couple of things that I'll second from Council Member Bajent. Um, one is the great and thorough presentation. You and Public Works, you come so prepared. There's not always any questions that we have because you've already covered everything and it, and it really is appreciated. Um, great plan, looks wonderful. Uh, I would also second the coffee thing. My partner has an expectation that we can leave 45 minutes before our flight takes off and somehow still get a hot tea before we get on the plane. And so it's gotta be there and fast and um, airport really does a great job, but I think that that speed in those beverages uh, is something that, that people probably see on a normal basis. I know that that's not what you want to recommend people showing up 45 minutes. Um, so that's our own problem. Uh, the last thing I would just uh, comment on is I was excited to see some of the things on the RFP. I think that the, I think it was percentage A, B, C, D, E, F, um, whatever that was, uh, anything that we're doing to encourage female owned minority businesses is wonderful. And I guess maybe one comment would be, maybe there are some areas to explore when it comes to sustainability as well as some of the proposals. The airport has done, and the airlines as well, have done such a great job offering recycling services throughout the airport, also on the airplanes. And it would be great to see some of our vendors um, doing the best they could when it comes to navigating some of that packaging, figuring out what they can do you know, to help with some of our sustainability goals. It's an excellent point. Thank you for that. Great. And if there's, I actually you, yeah. do have a quick question, Hi, Rebecca. Um, just wondering. So I saw in the, it looks like in the evaluation there was that um, the women-owned diversity piece, but I didn't see that in the RFP criteria. Is that, and I, I wouldn't have thought to ask it, but you just brought that up again, which made me think of it. So is that part of the criteria for, or the the evaluation? It will be part of the evaluation. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Great. I think, I think you did it. I think you did it in under 45 minutes. All right. Yeah. Always a pleasure. Thank yeah. you for Good your job. attention and your interest. And I don't think we have an executive session. So with that, we'll go on break until the evening session at six.